It's amazing how the Holy Spirit reminds us and affirms in us the things that he desires us to know and to hear and to receive. But as I was thinking about that song, Lord, I, I want to be tried by fire. I want to be, I want to be purified. It, we're declaring to the Lord, like, Lord, I want you to wreak havoc on my life if you need to, to make me the man or woman of God that you've called me to be. And I hope this morning we can sense and feel the gravity of that declaration. Lord, I want to, I'll be honest with you, sometimes, Lord, I don't want to be trapped by fire. <laughs> sometimes I want to be left alone, Jesus. But how beautiful is it when the grace of the Lord allows us to walk through difficulty and suffering so that his purpose might be most beautifully fulfilled in us and through our lives. Listen, this morning, if you're in Philippians 1, we're going to read 12 through 26, and then we're just going to work through it together. I'm going to give you three certainties of suffering this morning and then three reasons to rejoice. So I, I, I hope you just hang with me. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest, that my imprisonment is for Christ, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, and not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers, and hear this this morning, the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed at all, or at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, always cry, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for you. Yet I, what, what I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that this will remain, or that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you. Again, let's pray together and we'll get after it. Father, you are the greatest of all time. Lord, there's none like you. There's never been any like you and there will never be any like you. You are infinitely better than anything we could experience on this planet. So God, I pray this morning as we take a few minutes to dive into the text. Lord, as we look at your word, I pray, God, that you would do in our hearts what we cannot do for ourselves, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear, God, our hearts to receive all that you have for us, God, so that we don't miss a thing this morning. Lord, what I know to be a reality is that someone, God, maybe many, walked into this room this morning having faced not just this week or this month or this year, but in their lives, unimaginable suffering. And God, I pray that what you would do in this place through the power of your spirit is to remind us this morning that if we have you, we have everything. And even in the suffering, we have reason to rejoice. So Jesus, as I always pray, and as simply as I know how to put it, God, just do work. That's who you are. It's what you do. God, do work. And we'll be glad in Jesus' name. And everybody together said... Amen and amen. One of the incredible things about this text, so spe specifically looking at Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, it's easy to realize that Paul has this desire to settle the hearts, if you will, of the church at Philippi. And they were concerned about him. They had already sent Epaphroditus. They were like, Epaphroditus, take this gift to Paul. Check on him. He's in prison. We don't know if he's doing good. We don't know if he's doing bad. We don't know if he's excited. We don't know if he's discouraged. Like, just go check on our boy Paul. So Epaphroditus shows up, and Paul is pinning this letter. He's writing this letter, pouring out his heart. He's wanting to know, like, guys, listen, the thing that is happen happening to me, this suffering has been met with an incredible amount of rejoicing because I know that this suffering I'm walking through is really to advance the gospel. So point number one, if you're taking notes this morning, three certainties of suffering from Paul's perspective. Number one, suffering can be, and I would argue is often a catalyst for the purpose of God in your life. Suffering 
many times in our lives. If we, if we look at suffering through the lens of the gospel, and we're going to get there in point two, but suffering is often a catalyst for the purpose of God in our life. We sang it earlier. God, I want to be tried by fire. I want to be refined. I want to be the man you've called me to be, the woman you've called me to be. So for that to happen, I know that there is a sanctifying fire that you're going to pull me through to produce in me the things that you've called out of me. Suffering can be a catalyst for the purpose of God. So hear me say this this, church, this morning, church. God is as present in your suffering as he is in your success. God is as present in your suffering as he is in your success. And hear me say this. I'll take it a step further. His plan is just as active in your suffering as it is in your success. Isn't it incredible how when something good happens, somebody graduates or, or somebody, you know, they... They do great in sales that month or, or, or something incredible happens in their lives and, and we see it from a successful point of view and we're like, praise the Lord, God is so good, he's on the throne. And then when suffering happens, it produces usually in a believer an incredible amount of silence. We treat God like he's a bad author that let the pen slip out of his hand. But the Bible says that he's sovereign, so God is pinning all of these things for his glory and for our good, for his renown and our refinement. God is just as present in your suffering as he is in your success, and he is just as present. His plan is just as active in your suffering as it is in your success. And this was incredible to me. We're okay with this in the lives of other people as long as it doesn't have to be our story. Right? Listen, we look in on the life of Joseph, and we, we, man, we'll shout about it. We'll say, oh, man, did you see how God took him from, he was a dreamer and his brothers wanted to kill him and they threw him into a pit and they took him out of the pit and they threw him into slavery. And then out of slavery, he walks into a place of prestige and from a place of prestige, he's lied on and he's thrown into prison. And then from a place of prison, he's finally promoted. Praise God. Woo. As long as that's Joseph, right? God, don't, don't make that my story. We're okay when it's Job. We love to quote him, don't we? Yet though he slay me, I will, God, thank you for giving me Job's words. Don't let me be Job. Faith family, this morning, we have to realize that even in the suffering, God is doing, working, authoring unimaginable things for his glory and for our Good And listen, every ounce of suffering experienced in the scriptures that you see through these men and women that I'm about to mention and have mentioned two of already, the suffering in their lives proved to be a pathway to joy for themselves and for others. Joseph gets into a place of promotion through years and years of suffering and is able to be provision for his brothers and for his whole people. Job, at the end of his life, he, at the end is greater than the beginning. He sees encouragement and beauty and the restoration of all things that he considered lost. But then, hear me say this, we, we're okay with the suffering when it's the story of Jesus, right? The perfect son of God hanging on the cross between earth and sky for my sin and your sin. Jesus says, Lord, let this cup pass from me, but if it be your will, I will drink it till the last drop. And he did. Scripture says he endured suffering, despising the shame for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So this morning, we want that to be true of other people's lives, but sometimes when God is trying to work that same glory in our lives, we get bitter and resentment, resentful, Cynical, and I'm going to get there in a minute, but the last one, and this is the one as I was sitting in the text, reading the text, I couldn't help but think of Mary. What kind of suffering must it have been? Man, Jesus, Jesus' is mama. She's standing at the foot of the cross looking at her baby. I didn't understand that when I, when I was younger and I didn't have kids, but, you know, they say, I don't care how old my, kid, my son gets or my daughter gets, they're still going to be my babies. You know what I'm saying? My kids are, I, I hear this all the time. I love you, baby. I'm not a baby anymore, Dad. I'm not a baby. The mother of Jesus standing at the cross, looking at the body of her precious sinless son, 
get completely destroyed so that you and I could go free. Listen, there's an earthly pain, but whatever she, I can't even begin to imagine what she must have experienced in her soul as she watched the hands of her son nailed to the cross and his feet likewise. As the crown of thorns was crushed onto his head and And as she stood in the crowd and insults were hurled past her and spit maybe even hurled past her, we know they spit on him and they pulled from his beard. And this mama's watching this happen to her son. And you know what's amazing? Mary never raised a fist to God and said, but you said he was ours. She knew that this suffering was part of the plan and she surrendered to it. She never gets bitter with God the Father. You never see Mary raise her voice and say, God, stop this atrocity. She stands at the foot of the cross and she watches the Son of God die and give up his life for the sake of humanity and all that would come to redemption. And then you know what she does? She's a part of a group of women. They take his body and get him ready for burial. (laughs) May it be that she was convinced this is just only going to last a little while. But she watched it. She embraced the suffering. And oh, what joy has been set before us for the, the, the suffering that Jesus endured. What blessing have we received? Because his suffering was the catalyst. It, it was the purpose of his life on earth. And it was the plan of God. Scripture said, listen, Jesus on the cross suffering for your sin and my sin was not God's plan B. The scripture said that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. This was always plan A for God. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God love, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This morning, there is a progression in this life. There is a beautiful progression from suffering to perseverance and from perseverance to hope. So hear me say this, and we're going to get here in a minute. This is the good stuff, all right? You might be suffering today, but joy is on its way. Do you hear me this morning? You might be suffering in this moment, but joy is going to come with the sunrise. I want you to hear this. Point number two, suffering alters and refines us in a way that comfort and achievement never could. These are three certainties of suffering that I see from verse 12 to verse 26. Suffering alters us and refines us in a way that comfort and achievement never could. You were singing the song, I want to be tried by fire, purified, take whatever you desire. And it it harkens back to this idea in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah comes face to face. Daniel even talked about this, prayed about this earlier today. It is this beautiful picture where Isaiah comes face to face with the glory of God. And he says, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And the Bible says that the seraphim went and took a coal from the altar and touched it to his lips and said, you have been now cleaned. You know what he said? You've been purified by fire, bro. How uncomfortable How altering must that moment have been for Isaiah standing in the presence of God, beholding the glory of God to the level and capacity that God would allow it and a coal from the altar to encounter his life. You say, man, that must have been painful. It would have surely been altering, but see what it really did was carterize the wound of sin. See, he said, my lips are unclean. So God said, here, let me me purify. It might be uncomfortable, The suffering might not be pleasant. It might not be what you thought you signed up for, but it is working in you the glory of God. It is altering your life in such a way that you're going to see God and love God and know God in a way that achievement and acclaim and prestige could never alter in your life. So we have this option of how we treat our suffering and how we deal with our suffering. We can, by grace, view it through the lens of the gospel, or we can view our suffering this morning through the lens of the flesh. I want to tell you a story. Many of you have heard it. If you've grown weary of it, I'm not going to apologize. I'm just going to tell anyways, but I still love you, right? 2016, um, August of 2016, you've heard, most of you heard this story. Both of my eardrums rupture in a Sunday morning worship service. I have in-ears in, and and, uh, instantly, 
Never really in my life struggled with panic or anxiety, depression, or any of those things. And instantly, um, I, I, it, it authored in my life this high-pitched ringing called tinnitus. And this is what I, I found out what it was called. Uh, I just thought I was going crazy at first. <laughs> kind of was, probably. And so it's ringing, and, and I can't sleep. And, and, and I get in this place where I'm overwhelmed with anxiety. And, and I'm like, and I'm, I'm beginning to say this to God. I'm like, God. And now, granted, this is your pastor, your worship leader, Raising the fist of God, saying, God, Lord, I've, I've led worship since I was 16 for you. I've, I've been telling people about Jesus since I was 16. I've preached, and, and God, I, I'm even in a church where I, I don't know how many people even like me anymore. God, I'm doing all these things for you. These were the things I was literally telling God in 2016. I've done all this for you, and God, you let this happen to me. The one thing that I need to like do my job and operate in the gifting that you've gifted me, why? And I was so bitter and frustrated I became cynical. I, there were moments I looked at my life, I was like, I don't even think, I don't even know, why, God, does God even love me anymore? And I allowed my flesh to use my suffering for a season and a moment to turn me into somebody that God had not created me to be. I was bitter. I was cynical. I was confused. God, why? God, why, 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 would, you, why would you do this? Why would you affect me in this way? And in the same month, God, we're talking like a 30-day time span. We've, we've been fostering for a while and working this adoption plan, and the, the, the judge orders the child to go back home. And so we're rejoicing that this nuclear family is going to stay together. And at the same time, we are devastated that this child of over two years is gone from our home within a 30-day notice, and we are gutted. And I'm laying on my bed saying, God, where are you? God, why me? And in this moment, I had a great friend. Now, I was so overwhelmed. I'd never really dealt with deep depression, but I was walking through this season several months into depression, doing everything that I could to, to get out of bed in the morning. There were even a few Sundays where my wife helped me put on my shoes so that I could come to church and preach, and God would give me grace in the pulpit. And I would spend my weeks, several weeks, just in the Word alone, God, deliver me. God, deliver me. And in the midst of that, I had a friend come to my house, and I was just walking in the yard praying. And he said, TJ, I came to tell you something. Well, I feel like the Lord wants me to tell you something. I'm like, uh, and I just know he's like, I told the team earlier, I was like, I'm thinking like he's going to pull like some, like some frankincense and myrrh oil out, and he's going to like anoint my ears, and I'm going to be instantly healed. And God brought him to give me a word. You know what I'm saying? And he said, God's going to use this suffering to increase your capacity to love people. He's going to use this suffering to increase your, capacity, your compassion. He's going to use this suffering to humble you. And he's also going to use this suffering to increase your capacity to suffer. God is stretching you to be able to endure and to be a better leader and a greater servant. All these things. At the time, I was like, bro, go home. <laughs> That's not what I wanted to hear. That's my friend Tim Bison he just spent a few minutes walking around in the yard with me, praying over me, and, and saying this back to me over and over. This morning you say, TJ, why do you tell us that? Because when we choose to view suffering in light of the gospel, which is what God allowed to happen in my life through his grace. Listen, I'm a failure, all right? I want you to know that. I'm not a perfect Christian. I make more mistakes than probably most of you in the room, all right? But God authored this moment of grace in my suffering to where he allowed the bitterness to turn into humility, the confusion became compassion, and the cynicism became perspective. Second Corinthians 4, 17 through 18 says, for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not on the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Hear me say this. In those moments of suffering, when I was tr crying out to God, why me? When I was cursing God, when I was angry with God, when I was frustrated with God, in the middle of the suffering, God was working in the unseen to make me the man he called me to be. Hear me say this, and I'm still far from it. In your suffering, God is doing something in the unseen for your good and for his glory. And if we can fight, edge against, war against the bitterness that flesh would love to produce in us and the cynicism, we might, by the grace of God, see all that he has for us. Because this light momentary affliction is doing something. 
It's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. Last point, under the three certainties of suffering, and then we'll move into three reasons to rejoice. The last point this morning under three certainties of suffering is this, is that suffering is not the whole story. It's just a season. In moments that God gives me the opportunity to, to counsel and to do counseling, I get to, I get to say this over and over and over. And it's my heart this morning that maybe you're in that place. Maybe you're on day one or day three or, or week seven of that dark season, that unimaginable anxiety, that heavy depression. Maybe you're in a season of family tension or, or work drama or life difficulty or a health diagnosis that you don't understand. I want you to hear, if you grab anything this morning, I want you to hear this, that this is not your whole story. It's just a season. You say, TJ, are you certain of that? Listen, Psalm 35, for his anger is but for a moment and his favor for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Listen, I don't know if it's going to be one night, 10 nights, 20 nights, 365 nights, but this is what I know. It is not your whole story. It's just a season. This suffering that you're walking in, this difficulty, this darkness, maybe it's fear. Maybe it's sickness. It is not your story. It's just a part of it. And it's just a season. There will be a day that God turns the page. You say, no, 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 TJ. <laughs> this is my story. God's over here trying to turn the page, and you're like clinging to it like, no. Let him turn the page. This suffering doesn't have to be your story. Can I say this? The suffering that happened to you five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, unimaginable darkness that you may have walked through that you're allowing to dictate your life. Hear me say this. It does not have to be your story. Put it back in its season. Allow the grace of the Lord to work in you a joy that can only be defined and described by the power of his Holy Spirit. So here we go. Three reasons to rejoice. I'm going give to these, give these to you quickly. Number one, when you think about Paul, you think about the season. Obviously, he's in a season of suffering, but he's clearly communicating to the church, right? Like what has happened to me has happened for the advancement of the gospel. In that, I rejoice that more people are hearing the gospel. The gospel being shared with Roman, prisoner, Roman prisoners. It's being shared with Roman soldiers. Like people are coming to faith because of my suffering, and I am glad of that. That's what he's saying. And then he gives us this idea, these, these few words, that the spirit of Jesus is working. So the number one reason to rejoice this morning, in the three reasons to rejoice, is that the spirit of Jesus has not stopped working just because your suffering has started. You hear me this morning? The Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, listen to, we'll, we'll read it from Galatians 4, 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you have the Spirit of Jesus living in you. And hear me say this. If you are a believer, who you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you've believed in your heart, you've been transformed, radically redeemed by the power of the Spirit. Hear me say this. The Spirit is working even if you don't realize it. The Spirit is working in the unseen for the glory of God and for your good. And this momentary suffering, in this momentary suffering, the Spirit of Jesus is doing the unimaginable. Oh, if you would cling to him this morning and see it. This is the Spirit he talks about. And this is what he is doing. What is Romans 8, 28? And we know that for those who love God, and a call to, he works all things together for those who are called according to a purpose, that love him and are called according to his purpose. For we know this, right? We know this is what he says, that all things work together for the good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. I heard one pastor one time say, like, man, this is the worst verse to give someone when they're in their suffering, right? You're trying to cheer them up, trying to encourage them. I'm like, no, 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 no this is the verse. <laughs> this is the verse. The Spirit of Jesus is at work in your suffering, church. The Spirit of Jesus is present in your hardship. Hear me say it like this. The Spirit of Jesus has not abandoned you. He's not forgotten you. He's not forsaken you. You say, TJ, you don't know how, how dirty I am, how bad my past is, how riddled my shame is. Listen, hear me say this. Jesus this morning said, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He didn't say, come to me, you who are clean and perfect, and I'll let you join the club. That is not how Jesus operates. The spirit of Jesus is working right now in your suffering. And hear me say this, even if it's at the hand of your own doing, 
the Spirit of Jesus is working right now in this moment for his glory and for your good. He has not forgotten you. He's so for you this morning. The Spirit of Jesus is so for you today. There's a reason to rejoice the Spirit of Jesus at work. The reason to rejoice is Christ is everything and can be everything to us. Listen to what he says here. I'll tell you this first, and then I'll let's see what he says here. When Christ is your everything, nothing can overcome you. This is what's incredible about Paul. When Christ is your everything, nothing can overcome you. He said what? To live as Christ, to die as gain. I said this earlier. I heard one pastor say one time, he said, Paul must have been the most frustrating guy to persecute in, out of all the guys that were ever persecuted. Because like, Paul, we're going to kill you. And Paul's like, to die is gain, baby. They're like, Paul, we're going to let you live. To live is Christ. Paul, we're going to beat you. I rejoice in my sufferings. It's like, like, if you're that guy that's tasked to persecute Paul, you're just like, well, this is going to be a terrible day at the office. You know? Why? Well, because Christ was everything to Paul. So, and that's what he says in the middle. If you'll notice the drama that's going on in, in, in the church a little bit, these, these guys have come in and started to tear down Paul, tear down Paul to advance themselves. But this is what's beautiful. Hear me say it like this. When Christ is your everything, the opinions of others no longer means that much to you. When Christ is your everything, slander no longer scars you like it used to. When Christ is your everything, pain no longer has the same power over you. When Christ is your everything, family, family tension can literally begin to dissolve. When Christ is your everything, workplace drama can be put to the side for the glory of Christ. When Christ is your everything, hear me say this, nothing can overcome you. That's where Paul was. How powerful of a guy is it that says, hey, you can take my wealth. You can take my physical comfort. You can take all my belongings. The one thing you can't take from me, you cannot take from me is Christ Jesus. And he's my everything. Everything is subject to Christ being everything in our lives. I want you to hear Romans chapter 8, 31 through 39. Because this is the heartbeat. This is the fuel behind this perspective. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So here you go. Here is your everything. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things. Please listen to this this morning. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, I love the translation that says, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Listen, when he is your everything, you have nothing to lose. You hear me, church? When he is your everything, you have nothing to lose. He's all that you need. And you could be stripped of everything that this world esteems, everything that this world appreciates, and having him, you'd have everything. Last point I want to give you. And this is what, one thing I love about Paul and what made him so impactful and so powerful is that he reaches a point in his letter, and it's clear, it has to be clear to the church in, at Philippi, that death is no longer a fear of Paul's. And, and I want to hearken back to a point that I made. The death of his, his reputation is no longer a fear to him. The death of his worldly goods is no longer a fear to him. The death of his esteem by church people is no longer a fear of his. The death of his own body, the death of his comfort, the death of his status, there were no longer a fear. There was no longer a fear. And when the fear is de of death is vanquished for the believer, the possibilities are endless. Don't you hear that? When the fear of death is vanquished, the possibilities for the believer are endless. You know what that means? That means I share my faith with people that I used to try to impress. You mean it begins, begins to alter in me a desire to serve people that I used to not want to be seen with. 
Our reputation doesn't matter anymore. My own perceived spiritual elitism or whatever that junk is, all of that goes out the window because to live is Christ and to die is gain. When you have something or someone, excuse me, living fully for Christ with fearless abandonment, what you have at the end of the day, you'll have kings being converted on the edge of a lion's den. You'll have prodigal hypocrites, much like your pastor, <laughs> with a past and pain leading people to Jesus. You'll have men and women giving up the American dream to serve in foreign lands. And you'll have a church full of ordinary, everyday Christians living fearless lives of abandonment, fully loving God, fully loving people, and committed to multiplying disciples. Because to live is Christ, to die is gain.